Okay. I believe we are recording. Welcome, Sharon Hottie Miller, to the podcast. We are so excited you are here. It's great to be with you. Okay, so we actually had um, your new book recommended to us by several of our listeners, so I cannot wait to talk about that, but there may be a few people listening who don't know who you are, and we want to make sure that by the end of this podcast, they all know you, know how to connect with you, and how to find your book. So um, we know you as as wife to Ike, Mm -hmm. and you two are co-pastoring a church plant, which Mm -hmm. just is, is an adventure all by itself. You have three hilarious kids that, that show up on your Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, we yes. love seeing them from time to time. I want people to know this about you too. You have a master's in divinity from Duke. Yes. And a, and a PhD on the topic of women and calling. Yes. We could talk about that for hours. Unfortunately, yes. we don't have time today, but y'all are um, in Durham, North Carolina. I'm sure mm-hmm. it is absolutely beautiful there in the fall. It is. And, and what else, is there anything else that you just want our listeners to know about you before we dig in? I don't think so. I think that those are the, the highlights. I was thinking, uh, you mentioned my kids being hilarious. I have to tell a story. This is like a TMI parenting story. Is this we like a place those. for that? Okay. 100%. Because I, I have to share, you know, you have those parenting moments where you're like, I have to tell another adult of like the indignity that I just experienced, you know, parenting. So I just told you before we started recording that there's a stomach virus running through my family right now. And on Friday, my oldest, he was the first one. He was the weak link, like the gateway into our family. And so he threw up, I, he must have, I didn't even see it. I'm pretty sure he threw up into the sink in his bathroom, the kid's bathroom. And I didn't get a chance by the next day to like fully scrub that sink. And so that night, the next day, I told my middle, who's seven, to go brush his teeth. And that sink is, it's also like clogged for some reason. And so it was like backed up a little bit. And so I told him to go brush his teeth. And then I follow up behind him to make sure he's doing it. And I see he has taken his toothbrush and he's using it to scrub the sink. Oh, Sharon. (laughs) And then he lifts it out and I see him start to put it into his mouth. And I was like, no, (laughs) what are you doing? And I snatched the toothbrush out of his hand and it's an electric toothbrush that's, it's like a baby Yoda. And I was like, this is done. This toothbrush, this toothbrush is done. And he burst into tears because, you know, he loves the toothbrush. And I was like, I don't know. I can try to salvage it because it's an electric toothbrush. I can't run it through the dishwasher. Like I've got to figure out how to sanitize this thing. And, you know, he burst into tears. Like it really hurts his feelings. And I said, but you can't use your, your toothbrush to clean the sink. Like Isaac threw up in that sink and he goes, he goes, well, I didn't know there was throw up in it. And I said, honestly, doesn't matter. Like you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be using your toothbrush to clean the sink. Like your, your brother and sister spit into that sink. Like whether or not they're sick, they spit like, don't use a toothbrush to clean anything but your teeth. And then I, I, I said, have you used your toothbrush to clean the sink before? And he goes, no. And then he goes, well, once, which oh, no. probably <laughs> means like many times. <laughs> and I was like, he's my child that if there was a class on basic hygiene, we would enroll him because there, I don't understand. Like I, I literally, after that, I, I said, I need you to understand you cannot use your toothbrush to clean the toilet. You cannot use your toothbrush to clean anything, but Mm -hmm. your teeth, (laughs) that is it. And the things that like, you think you don't need to explain. Mm -hmm. So I just needed to put that out there because I'm sure other people can relate, but. We, we have loved your voice for several years for many reasons. And can I just say, this is a brilliant example of you are one of us, Sharon. We could not be happier (laughs) about that. Oh, there, there is a little bit of me that longs for that kind of freedom. See, I hear those stories and I think there's some freedom in there. I, I'm, I would net, you know, anyway, we could go off on, on a tangent, but 
um, we're, we're glad you're normal. We're glad you understand <laughs> us as a mom and as a wife. Um, and, and I do want to mention too, because I'm sure your, your name will sound familiar to people. You've written two other great books, nice and free of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and we highly recommend those. We, we've read your writing on Christianity today and she reads truth and propel and, and so many places. And, and what Fran and I love to do is just expose our listeners to voices we trust, um, people we're learning from. And, and first of all, just thank you for being one of those voices that we really are able to listen to. We trust things that come out of your mouth. We know they're backed mm -hmm. up by scripture, but you're also so real. So thank you for being all those things for us. It's really encouraging. Thank you. Well, I, I want to say this too. When, when a few of our listeners, we, we put out on stories, hey, what should we read for the summer? And several of them immediately mentioned your book, The Cost Aww, of Control. That's so now, encouraging. Let, let me tell you, yes, it's encouraging, but also I felt like I had been slapped upside the head. And then I, <laughs> <laughs> then I bought your book and felt like I was being slapped upside the head. Every chapter I read, it, was, it, it gave me that feeling of, oh my goodness. I don't want to read this, but I have to read this. I, mm -hmm. People that know me well will say, <clears throat> you know, or wouldn't be surprised to hear that, that I have control issues, that I'm a control freak. Um, it, it just really resonated to those parts of me. Um, I'm consoling myself a little bit in the fact that after reading it, I think that's all of them too, and not just me. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's part of my control is going, guess what? It's also you. It's not just me. But, but tell us why, why this book, why is this message on control something that you felt compelled to write about? So the, the birth of the message came from the pandemic and I'm still just so mad at myself that I wrote a pandemic book because when everything happened, I was like, I will not write a pandemic book. I know that this <laughs> is going to be the event that launches a thousand books and I, I'm not going to write a pandemic book, but then, you know, God doesn't care about my my opinions. So I was paying attention, watching to how the, the folks in our church were responding to the pandemic and paying attention to how Christians online were responding to the pandemic. And it became evident very quickly that it was exposing this major idol of control because our certainty, you know, was taken away. And rather than draw on the spiritual tools available to us from millennia of Christians that came before us in scripture and the power of Jesus, we took all of our control issues to the internet instead. And, and, see, and buying toilet paper. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> and so you could see how everyone was taking their fears, taking their control issues to the internet, researching, you know, finding all the data they could, whatever it was. And it was not producing peace. You know, it, it wasn't easing our anxieties at all. If, if anything, it was just amplifying it. And so I could see this happening and realize, okay, this is a discipleship issue. Like we are in a culture that is nurturing in us this illusion of control because of our technology, because of our medicine, you know, all of these advancements, they, they promise us this level of predictability and control in the world. And you could see that this had lulled us into this false sense of our, our mastery over the world. And then that was suddenly snatched away. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so that was really fascinating to me. I'm really interested in how culture is discipling us instead of Jesus. And so I really wanted to dive into that. But my best writing comes from my own conviction about my own sin. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I should turn, you know, the focus on myself and just consider whether or not this is something that I struggle with in some way. Because if you'd asked me three years ago, if I struggle with control, I would have said no, like, like I've, I've done a number of interviews about this that started out with people saying, how did you know you're a control freak? And I've said, I didn't, I would have never described myself that way. But what I discovered through this journey is that control is a human struggle. Like it's, it's universal, but it just manifests in different ways. And what this journey helped me to see is that I do struggle with control, some in, in the like stereotypical ways, 
but some in really, really subtle ways that I just never classified that way, but were really fueling my anxiety. And once I saw that, that was, that has been really helpful for me in my parenting and in my pastoring as well. That is just so fascinating because it, it's like I said earlier, like I know that I have control issues. <laughs> I think part of it for me, I've, 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 you know, a lot of therapy, done a lot of, of soul searching on it. I think part of it's because I'm paid to fix people's problems. So I have this sense that I'm somehow in control in my mm -hmm. job, but I also think there's a trauma response. I've, I've buried both my parents. There's, there's other things at play. So I think for some people, it's kind of obvious to look at us and go, well, yeah, you probably have control issues. But I love that you have been able to dig deeper and say, hold on, like, let, let's all pull back. There's something innate in us because we are fleshy. We have control and we've got to got to understand it, got to know what to look for. And then ultimately mm -hmm. what the solution is. A hundred percent. Okay. I'm also a big baseball fan. And so is Fran and we're in playoffs. So I'm thinking about these players, you know, that think I'll just wear the same pair of socks <laughs> every single game and never wash them. And that's what winning these ball games. What, what kind of things did you come across? Are there other just, just quirky examples or, or silly ways that you found mm -hmm. that, that we think we are in control somehow? Yeah. So what you're alluding to for anyone who hasn't read the book yet is the illusion of control. I have a whole chapter on this psychological concept called the illusion of control. And I had, I don't know about you, but I've used that phrase before the illusion of control, but mm -hmm. I did not know that's an actual psychological term that has inspired tons and tons of research. And what it basically describes is this almost human pathology to imagine that we have control even when we don't in order to make reality more like we can cope with reality better. And so this plays out in a lot of harmless ways, you know, like you just mentioned when players have these superstitions where they wear the same socks throughout the playoffs and that gives them this illusion of control. Another really funny example, I think I mentioned in the book is there's been studies done on casino players and how, when they want to roll a high number, they'll shake the dice harder. And when they want to roll a low number, they'll shake the dice softer. And that obviously does nothing like that's not a thing <laughs> but it gives you the sense that i'm actually doing something to you know help me in this game it's an illusion of control and so there's some really harmless ways that it plays out but one thing that i alluded to just a few minutes ago is that part of the problem for christians part of the thing that is really inhibiting our spiritual growth is we live in a culture that has really constructed a very convincing illusion of control and constantly promises us control. You know, you can know what the weather is probably going to be 10 days from now. You know, we even, we, we just came, Hurricane Ian, you know, just came through Florida and that was an, an event that we were paying attention to for about a week, you know, before it even hit. And so we're able to prepare. We're, we're, we're not able to control that hurricane, but we can definitely prepare for it. People can evacuate. We can know when your Amazon package is going to arrive, like probably within the window of time. We are also promised control over our bodies. You know, we're, we're promised either, you know, here's all these anti-aging products, or if you take practice this diet, you know, you can control your weight or you can, you know, keep yourself from getting cancer. We're, we're just marketed all of these promises of control. And because of our technology, we, we do have a level of predictability that is greater than, you know, a thousand years ago. They didn't know what the weather was going to be a week from now. And so it's not that that is nothing, but one of the things that I, I say in the book is that we, we act as if our control over the world has grown by miles when it has really only grown by inches. You know, there's still so much that we don't have control over. And yet, because of this illusion of control, we're not facing that reality. We are enabled to retreat into this, this illusion in so many different ways. And what was also really fascinating to me is, is part of the reason the illusion of control is so enticing 
is that it works. There's been all these studies showing that when you think you have control, you do feel better. Like it actually <laughs> lowers your anxiety. It actually lowers your depression. And so that's why we, we run to this illusion of control to be our peace. The only problem is it's not real. It is an illusion. And so sooner or later, that illusion will be shattered. And when that happens, we will be unequipped to face reality because we have been running from it <laughs> for so mm -hmm. long. And I think that's a, that's a really fascinating way of thinking about what we saw in those early months of the pandemic is, is that we were faced with this reality that we were not spiritually prepared for because of this illusion of control. I love that in the book, you talked about Ishmael because mm -hmm. one of one of the biggest spiritual lessons I've learned through ministry in the past few years, um, I serve on a, on a board and we out of fear and out of panic just made some hasty decisions. And in hindsight, it blew up in our faces and we could see really clearly that it was us manipulating a result and trying, you know, and, and we had good intentions, but we were, we were way too hasty. We, we knew better and we acted anyway. And now we have a phrase and, and my mentor is on that board and, and we say it all the time to each other as, as a caution, don't birth an Ishmael has become mm. our phrase because we we got in a hurry and and just thought you know well we we need to fill this spot and we need to do this and we need to do that and and we trusted the control that we had mm -hmm. yeah more more than we sought the lord and and we're willing to wait patiently how how do you see that play out in this context yeah that's really i love that that's a really helpful way of saying it so as I identified my own control issues and, and realized I struggled with control, I have known as long as I've been a Christian that I should not do that, <laughs> that I should not control. <laughs> and <laughs> if I, yeah, if I'm struggling to control, I need to stop and I need to let go and I need to surrender and trust God. And all that is true, but it has almost never helped me like in the in the thick of it when I'm wrestling with wanting to control something that I can't control just knowing that I shouldn't has has not been helpful to me and that's because knowing why we sh knowing that we shouldn't do something is not as powerful as knowing why and oh, part of what was really helpful for me and, and this is where the title of the book comes from the cost of control is knowing that whenever we try to control something that God has not given us control over, we are reenacting Genesis three, that, that moment in Genesis three, where, where Adam and Eve had everything they needed. They had freedom. They had power. They had authority. They had community. You know, they had everything they needed. The only thing they didn't have was control. They were not in charge of the garden. And so they decide we want more power than that. And, and whenever we reach for control to rescue us or soothe our anxieties or empower us in some way, we're just reenacting that moment. But we're also reenacting its consequences as well. And because of this, this, this relationship that was written into creation in Genesis 3, this is an inescapable cause and effect that any time we try to control something that God has not given us to control, we reenact those consequences. It always comes with a cost. And that is, this is a long way of answering what you're getting at is that that's what you're getting at. You know, mentioning Ishmael and Sarah and Abraham, we see after that moment in Genesis three, all the ways that these costs play out. And, and one of the ways they play out is in relationships where if you try to control people, it will break your relationships with them and and with others as well and, and we see this again and again in the relationship in the families in genesis and so with sarah and abraham is a great example where god had given them this vision and said this is my plan for your life you're gonna have all these children and then nothing happens and then nothing happens and nothing happens and nothing happens and eventually sarah starts to think maybe god needs my help you know, maybe <laughs> the story maybe, of my life. Yeah. Maybe I need to step in and engineer this outcome. And she gets what she wants immediately. You know, she has Abraham sleep with 
with Hagar, who's really their slave. And that is really, there's no strong enough words for how wrong that was to Hagar, but it, it creates all this relational brokenness. It, it doesn't fix things. It actually makes them worse. And, and that's what control does. When we turn to control to fix things, it actually breaks them worse. And so with Hagar, she has this, this son, Ishmael, but it does not solve everything for Sarah. It does not give her peace. It does not give her stability or security. It actually strips it away even more. And so suddenly she feels like she's in competition. She feels mocked by this other woman. And so she then, you know, is, is trying to plug the holes in the dam now. And so she sends Hagar and this boy away. And so now they're, you know, vulnerable. And so, and that, that causes just generational brokenness basically, but that's what happens. Anytime we try to control something we cannot control, it doesn't fix it. It will break it more. And the stakes are especially high when we're talking about relationships where, where if we try to control the people in our lives, it's not going to play out the way that we think it will. It's actually going to fracture our relationship with them more. And so I love that. Don't birth an Ishmael. That's like a great, that's a, a great saying for like so many different things. Cause it's really, it's, it's true. It's a great way well, of thinking about it. It's a great phrase. And it, it's also like a dagger to my heart because if I just <laughs> had a dime for every time I've had to say, don't do it, don't do it. Don't do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I love too in the book that you brought up theology because, mm -hmm. you know, in our culture, we hear so many things that, you know, name it and claim it or prosperity gospel. And, and I don't even know that people know the difference. And I, I, I would love for you to hit on that. Just, just, I know it's hard to do that briefly, but I want to make sure we have clarity and truth for our listeners, because I, I think a, a lot of times just, you know, especially for new believers, we get really easily confused with what you see on Instagram and what's out there. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they may be believing a lie and not even know it. So speak yeah. into the theology and, and how control comes mm -hmm. into different theological beliefs. I'm so glad you asked that because th that's actually one of my favorite chapters. I, for those of you who haven't read it yet, I have a, ch I have a section of the book looking at the different ways that we try to exert control in our lives, the different sort of tools or recourses of control. And some of those are the ones that you would expect power, money, shame is actually a really powerful form of control. But one that is probably less intuitive is theology. And we use control, we use theology to control in a couple of different ways. And in each of these sections, I break it down in two different ways because I actually define control in two different ways. I talk about control as the ability to impose your will on people and circumstances. But control, going back to the illusion of control, is also just about a feeling. And, and for a lot of us, that's really what we're after is just that feeling feeling of being in control. And so each of these tools, I look at how do we use this to impose your will, but also how do you use this just for you to make the world feel more in control for you? And so with theology, you, some people use theology to control people. Those are called cults, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but the much more common way that, that we relate to theology to give ourselves a feeling of control is called the prosperity gospel. And for anyone who's not familiar with the prosperity gospel, it's this idea that you need to earn your standing with God, or you need to earn the good things in your life. And so if, if things go well for you, if you experience success, if you experience prosperity, it's because you are a good Christian or because you are a good person and, and God is pleased with you. But if you experience setbacks, if you experience failure, you know, loss, whatever it is, it's because you, you failed in some way and that you have let God down or you have not been as faithful as you should have been, that, that you got this illness because you didn't have enough faith, you know, whatever. That is, is the prosperity gospel in a nutshell. And we see it, it espoused even by the disciples. It's a really t common human temptation to relate to God that way. And you see it specifically in the disciples when they encounter this man born blind. And the first question that they ask is, 
who sinned you know for this man to be born blind like was it him was it his parents like who sinned to cause this to happen to him and that is prosperity theology at work it's looking for this cause and effect where we we either behave or we don't behave and if, if someone you know is sick it's because they didn't behave and this is their punishment but what is really happening in that moment that is so easy to miss is what the disciples are really doing is they are reckoning with their own vulnerability in an uncertain and broken world. Mm. And they are fumbling after a narrative that makes the world feel more predictable. Because if they can blame this man or his parents for what has happened to him, and they can give a reason for it, they can say, well, I don't do that. And therefore, I am safe. This will not happen to me. And at the bottom of that, that's just about control. That's a way of narrating the world theologically in a way that makes you feel more in control. And we see this play out in, you know, really obvious ways with the, the, the prosperity preachers who promise if you just give this money or if you have this portion of faith that this is going to protect you. But to me, it's really convicting. I can see this in my own life as well when I'm like scrolling through social media and I come across some tragic story of a family. And the, the first questions I start asking are, you know, well, where do they live and, and how do they parent and what is their lifestyle or what are the choices that they made so that I can sort of pin what happened to them to that lifestyle and that makes me feel, well, I don't do that. So this, so I'm safe from that. That's, that's not going to happen to me. And so that, that, again, that's just about feeling more in control. And it's really, really important to clarify that on the one hand, Proverbs really does explain to us when you live wisely, when you make wise decisions, that, that it, it is going to lead, lead to this flourishing life. Whereas if you choose sin, if you choose you know, pride, if you, if you choose self-destruction, you know, whatever it is that that's going to lead you towards death. And so we, we do have these categories, but the way that it is different from that is different from the prosperity gospel is that the prosperity gospel has no category for a book of the Bible, like Ecclesiastes, which says, why do the wicked prosper? <laughs> because sometimes the wick sometimes the wicked prosper because they're cheating, you know, because they're mm -hmm. greedy, not because they have God's favor. And so the world is is much more complex, much more more nuanced than we want it to be. And prosperity theology, it gives us this very simple explanation that that makes us feel better in the short term, but is not is not reality, is not, is not biblical, and, and is quietly nurturing this idol of control. When we're able to zoom out and look at it from a, from a broad lens, it, it sounds so silly. And then in my everyday, you know, I'm, I'm going to struggle with this, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. not forever, but maybe this may be my thing. I just struggle with till Jesus comes back, but our, our brains cannot handle it. But my logical brain just continually tries to make everything make sense and fit into some some neat little pattern and, mm -hmm. and we were never designed for that. And mm -hmm. it, it clicks when I'm having this conversation with you, but I'm, I'm just, my prayer is that I'll carry this with me because goodness gracious, it's so eye opening. And we have so much information through the internet and, and in these little smartphones that are constantly in our hands and in our purses and in our pockets. And, and I love that you, you said in your book, it's no coincidence that apple, that forbidden fruit <laughs> is mm -hmm. on that, is on that logo. And I'm, I'm trying to look at that now and go, hold on, you know, is this where I'm turning for, mm -hmm. for control and comfort? Is, is this, is this my God or am I going to let God be God? But, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to talk a minute too about agency because, because we've talked about a lot of things that, that, you know, I, I feel like are exposing some things in me and, and probably other people listening. There is hope y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, this is actually a hopeful conversation. And, and we're going to talk in a minute about the one thing that we actually can control. But explain to us about agency, about, you know, how we were created, what God's perfect design was for us. And, mm -hmm. and we've talked about how we get that wrong, but, but let's give hope to the listeners mm -hmm. of, of where, how we can turn this thing around. Mm -hmm. 
So the book is basically a long meditation on Genesis 3, that moment in Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve reach for that that fruit and eat it and just unpacking all of its implications for our lives. But in the last section of the book, I look at how God doesn't give us control, but he does give us agency. And this is what we see not in Genesis 3 so much, but in Genesis 1 and 2. Before sin enters the world, we see that Adam and Eve are not puppets. They're not robots. They're not, they're not prisoners. They actually have real power and influence and freedom. And the word that I use for that is agency, which is another psychological term that essentially means the power to influence yourself and your circumstances. And this is a little bit different than free will, because this has more to do with the efficacy of your influence in the world. But the operative word there being influence, that we have influence, we do not have control. And what was really essential to Adam and Eve's flourishing in Genesis 1 and 2 was honoring that that boundary, that they did have influence, but they didn't have control. And that's so different from, especially in our, our country, we tend to think of freedom as the absence of, of boundaries, that, that no one can tell you what to do, essentially. But the, the freest that any two people ever were was not in the absence of boundaries, but because of their boundaries. And so what I do in that that last section of the book is go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and look at this influence that they actually have, this power that they actually have, and ask, how did this play out? Like, what were the forms that this took so that we can put down the power that God has not given us to pick up the power that he has? Just so good. And then then I love how at the end you bring Jesus into it. So we're, Mm -hmm. we're in the Old Testament throughout the book. And then, Mm -hmm. then I don't, and I don't want to give the whole book away, but it's just such a powerful lesson. Just, is there anything from, from the very end that you want to share with our listeners? We've we've got to, we've got to end with Jesus, Sharon. He's he's coming. Well, the thing that I would say, you mentioned the very beginning of our conversation about when you bring in trauma, how that can create all these control issues and I think that is really important to name, but to also say that with all the compassion in the world, because the reality is we live in this post-Genesis 3 world, but we were created for Genesis 1 and 2. And so the fear that, that we feel, the desire to make right what is broken in this world, that, that desire to fix you know, what's, what's going on in in our lives and in the lives of people we love, that is not wrong. That is an echo of what you were created for. Like you were created for security. You were created for stability. And so desiring that was put in you by God. Where we go off the rails is believing that it is on us to fix that, that the the way that we pursue that security, that the way that we pursue that stability is by means of control. But remembering that first, God knows this world is broken. He knows it is scary, terrifying at times. He understands that he put in us this desire for stability. But then at the end of the day, it is he who makes it right. That is the whole reason that Jesus came in the first place is he is the only one that can fix it. Our control cannot. He is the only one that can rescue us from it. And so just knowing that that word of, of grace, I would say, for, for anyone who's struggling with control, not because you're proud, not because you are arrogant, you know, whatever, not because control is an idol, but just because the world is not as it should be. And mm. your soul is communicating that to you. And that is totally fine. Listen, I just want to put both hands in the air. <laughs> I'm amen. Everything you said, I, I truly when I got to the end of the book, I was sad and so hopeful and overjoyed all at the same mm. time. I felt lighter. I just, I cannot say enough from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. If I'm the reason you wrote that book, Aww, thank, you. thank you. But but I know our listeners are going to love it so much. Um, and you have a video series coming out. 
Yeah, actually. So I, all my books, I did video series with right now media. And so the six part series with, on the cost of control is actually today is the 10th. I think that we're recording. Mm -hmm. Uh, it comes out, I believe on the 11th. So tomorrow. So by the time this airs, it should be out on right now media. Oh, good. We've got, we've got a lot of ladies listening that, that serve in different women's ministries. This would be a fantastic study for some good. of those ladies so to glad. do together. How, how can our listeners connect with you, Sharon? What's the best way? I'm most active on Instagram. So Sharon H. Miller, that's, that's tends to be where I post. And Fran and I are really excited to do this when we have a guest, but especially this book, we're going to give away several copies on our social media, and we cannot wait to put your book in the hands of our listeners. So one more time, it's the cost of control, why we crave it, the anxiety it gives us and the real power God promises. Thank you so much, Sharon, for making time for us this morning. It's been fun. All right. Thank you guys for listening. And we will see you next week on Rambling Through Everyday Life with Fran and Angela. You know what? I think Fran's going to have to. I wondered about that. <laughs> I figured that would happen. <laughs> if y'all are, are still listening or still watching on YouTube by the time this thing rolls around. Last time we forgot to turn off the video on YouTube and they got a fun little extra rambling. We were glad we didn't say anything inappropriate. <laughs> Not that we would. <laughs>
Angela, wrap it up. I have no idea what to say other than bravo, well, everybody. We, we wrapped it up once, but then we realized we couldn't end it. So we just kept oh. hanging on. So we're going to wrap it up again. <laughs> All right. Listen, this is the kind of show we run around here. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. I love y'all. Have a great day. All right. Take care. Have a good week. Bye.